there are two angels that they are sitting on your left and right shoulder and they write good deed and bad deed then came to my mind that the narrator of this novel should be those angels tonight i have the pleasure of introducing shariar mandanapur Shayar is one of the most accomplished writers of contemporary Iranian literature, the author of nine volumes of fiction, one nonfiction book, and more than 100 essays in literary theory, literature and art criticism, creative writing, censorship, and social commentary. Tonight, he is here to share his latest novel, Moonbrow. This is the first event where we get to have both author and translator in conversation together. Sarah Khalili is an editor and translator of contemporary Iranian literature. She's translated a number of works, several volumes of poetry, many short stories, and at least five novels, including Shariar's previous novel, Censoring an Iranian Love Story. Shariar and Sarah will be joined in conversation with Restless Books publisher, Elan Stevens. Elan is the Lewis Sebring Professor of Humanities, Latin American, and Latino Culture at Amherst College, and a prolific author, most recently, of the poetry collection, The Wall. Please join me in welcoming Shariar, Sarah, and Elan. Let me begin by uh, saluting this bookstore for opening its doors to us. Uh, the role of uh, small um, and not so small bookstores is crucial in times like ours, uh, where free speech and uh, political engagement seem to be under threat. And the idea that we could sit all together here and celebrate the arrival uh, into our language and into our culture of a novel that comes from elsewhere and have both the author and the translator is in and of itself a statement of what uh, these bookstores can do. Uh, likewise, I want to say something quickly about the role of independent publishers as it was uh, mentioned in the introduction. Uh, I guess the difference between a big corporate publisher and the little fish that we are is that we not only publish less books, but that we publish books in the hope that we're also going to find a particular audience that is going to be able to open them. Uh, books are really not published for everybody. Books are published for particular readers, individual readers that matter. And the role of a, that the staff in those small publishing houses is to find that readership. It, it is a tireless, passionate, engaged effort, I can tell you firsthand how committed my, my colleagues are, and the fact that we're all here, and hopefully that you, after this, will be able to open this book and discover an extraordinary uh, narrative is, is a statement to that. Uh, I want to I begin uh, by simply calling attention to two statements on translation, given that this is today uh, an event connected with translation. One is by a Hebrew poet uh, of the early part of the 20th century, Chaim Nachman Bialik, who once said that reading a book in translation is like kissing a bride through a veil. In, in the second part of Don Quixote, a book that I love dearly, uh, Don Quixote and Sancho enter a print shop, which would be the equivalent of maybe a mix between a bookstore and a publishing house today. And they look around and find all sorts of books that come from other languages, many of them in translation from the Italian and the French and the Portuguese. Um, they are also books in Latin and Greek, um, chivalry novels, but the, the classics. And Sancho asks Don Quixote if there is a difference between reading a book in translation and reading a book in the original. And as is as he's wont to do in, in this novel, he goes into a diatribe that is long and exciting. And one line of that diatribe is that reading a book in translation is like looking at a Flemish tapestry through the back. You get to appreciate the colors and maybe uh, have the impression of what the silhouettes are, but somehow something is lost. And yet, either uh, the kiss through the veil or the tapestry that is, uh, is presented to us from the back 
It, without translation, we would be literally imprisoned in our own language. And in fact, often in the English language we are, we live in a country that is the most powerful, but only about three or four percent of the books that are published every year come from other languages. And it is hard to publish a book in translation. You have to work with the author and then with the translator too. Uh, you serve two masters and you have to just get it right. Get the tone right, get the story right. But when you do, as we are hoping that you will uh, join us in agreeing, uh, the experience is exhilarating. Uh, I, I have uh, in five years published several books, maybe I should say many books, uh, and I'm proud of all of them, but I feel that Moonbrow is a book not only for the present, but for the future, a book that will last, a book that competes with other um, uh, war uh, narratives from Tolstoy to John Dos Passos to Hemingway in an, an extraordinary way. And uh, the fact that it is arriving to us in this gorgeous English, um, a kiss or a tapestry, um, and makes the statement that it does is, uh, is extraordinary. Let's begin with a short reading, uh, both in Farsi and in English, and then we'll engage in a conversation. The book has a two-part prologue. Uh, which are basically the two narrators uh, of the book. Uh, Shariol will uh, read a piece of that in Farsi, and then I will read a piece of uh, the same in English, and then maybe a page of the actual story. Are you going to translate this? Mm, I already have. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, Again? <laughs> I would like to say something. Okay. Uh, writing in Persian is a hard job. I can just tell you about walking on a mine field. field. You have, okay, you have to do it. Walking like that. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> That's the point. So when I was in Iran, the idea of this novel came to my mind. I tried to write it, 80 pages. Then I said, no, it's not. Then I tried 60 pages. No, uh, something is wrong with this novel. I can It shouldn't be write it, like it. I was in Berlin that it came to my mind. There in Islam or Iranian culture, there are two angels that they are sitting on your left and right shoulder. And they write good deed and bad deed. Then came it to my mind that the narrator of this novel should be those angels. Not as good as Islamic version, but they have to write, and at the end of the day, they found out that somebody is censoring them, and somebody is checking them that is God. It is writing on his left shoulder. ای خرش توی بی پدر بنویسید رندی مرا که منم وقتی که منم 
اقرب نیش تیز کرده و رای تخم گاو میترا منم ارزای جفتی و مدام مرکیا هم منم بچه هایم منی زف... زنا روی ملاف خارش مازه میمو... میمون زیر با و باب منم ونگ ونگی خط در خلنگزار دجرو فرات شیر بریده جاده کرم پیچ ابریشم که منم آروق بارو توی هزار لای شکمه بنه آدم من. توی پس روی محرابتان جنازه باد کرده سرباز جنید جنین سخ شده هم منم من فاخته توی گودال ما نای الارحق حقی الارحق که منم And the scribe on his left shoulder writes, he thinks, O oh, bastard angels, write of the shrewdness that is I when I am me, I the scorpion with stingers sharpened for the testicles of Mitra's cow, I the mandrake's eternal gratification of coupling, my children the semen of adultery on sheets. I, the itch along the spine of the monkey beneath the baobab tree, the birth cry of script in the moors of the Tigris and Euphrates, the jug of soured milk, I, the warming silk road, I, the belt of gunpowder in the paunch of mankind, in the alcove of your altar, I, the bloated corpse of the soldier, the aborted fetus, the cuckoo's egg in a moon's crater, the chant of I am God, I, the right to sob, I am God. O motherless attendant angels on my shoulders, tell me, how far down my back have you ridden, clandestine scribes? Have you ridden as far as the red bulging strips of raw flesh, the scars of the Basiji's whip? Did the plowing whip not cross out your earlier words? Did the red marks of a woman's nails on my shoulders not make you hard? Did you write that I hollered no? Did you write that I saw children with their mouths foaming fall out of windows? Did you write that I saw sparrows drop from the trees and crows fall from the sky? That a dog burst in the alley? You angels who have only one hole and it is in your pen, your legs strapped around my neck. Did you write that you too were accomplices in crime? You were with me when you saw everyone die. You, everyone who was running and had or had not let go of their children, everyone who was standing and looking back, everyone who had fucked or prayed the night before, everyone who was a child and was drinking, was a cat and was licking, was even a fly, everyone died. Did you write that all those who were f hiding rotted in the cellars and that white smoke like camphor and cotton filled the seven holes of the dead. Write that I shout, oh, you pieces of dung descended from the sky. You killed everything. The scribe on his right shoulder writes, from the full length window in Rehana's room, he looks out at the rainy leafless garden and it occurs to him. It is good that the second floor is always the second floor. He sees the fog wafting from the soil beneath the naked trees, a hesitant fog with a hint of violet. The sound of rainwater in the gutters of the old building grows louder. Rehane asks, how can it be that in your dreams you see nothing of the girl's face? I don't know, her face is hazy. Perhaps I see it, but it doesn't stay in my memory. Maybe she has covered her face with a chador. I don't know. Sometimes I remember her hair, like a shadow. I think it's very long, all the way down below her breasts. I may have even seen her naked. Her hair covered her breasts. Hey, watch it. What? You're talking to your innocent, dewy-eyed sister. Don't play games with me, not you. What if there's a crescent moon on her forehead and it shines so bright that I can't see her face? No, this is all a tall tale. My dreams are not tales. In many of them, I see us putting rings on each other's fingers. So what, Rehane snickers? That's nothing. I dream that a prince comes to our house to ask for my hand in marriage. 
She stares at him warily and says, maybe you had a bitter or painful experience that you subconsciously wanted to forget. That's what the idiot doctor at the nut house said. But I want you to help me remember, tell me, what happened back then that could somehow be related to these dreams? I don't know. I'm surprised these dreams frighten you. I'm often frightened, and then I become even more frightened because I don't know what it is that I'm frightened of. Rehane's old samovar is gently simmering. He sees the fragrance of the 44 winter sweet bushes in the garden float toward the house like layers of dragonfly wings. So let me begin, Shahir, with a, with a couple of questions that I have for you. Uh, this is the story, uh, by the way, let me bring the audience here. This is the story of uh, Amir Yamini, a man who fights in the Iran-Iraq war and uh, then disappears. Um, when he is found, he has lost his left arm and he is infatuated. He returns to Tehran and he's infatuated with an image of a woman that he sees uh, that is connected with, that doesn't have a face, and he connects it with the moon brow. Uh, there is so much that is allegorical in this book. We heard about the two angels, the angel on the left shoulder and the angel on the right shoulder. There's also the search for memory, the family connection. The sister is the one that engages in this search uh, in Tehran itself. So I want to ask you first, uh, you yourself participated, you mentioned it at the beginning, in the Iran-Iraq war. Um, to what extent, after all these years, have you come to the conclusion that the the catastrophe, the enormity of a war, is possible to bring it down into a page, into a narrative. How, how, how much of your experience at the war did you pass on to the main character into, into this novel as such? Uh, please don't forget Just that before you Americans, we we fight Saddam Hussein army. It was a time that there was a invasion, yeah, mm -hmm. to Iran, and I decided to go to the my military services against Saddam Hussein army. So I went there and I thought that, okay, I am against the war. I am a rider. I am against the war. So I have to keep my soldiers alive. I have to help them. So I was there for 14 months, 15 months, as a young army lieutenant. Then I came back home alive. Then I started to write some stories after a few years. You know, when you are in the, uh, in a sort of event, you can write about it. It takes time. You have to pass a few years, then you can write about it. So if after a few years, I wrote about it. And Sarah was there. <laughs> Oh, she translated it. <laughs> One of the the in the story, Shahir, there's a there is the presence of that uh, limb, the the left arm that uh, is severed, and in order for him to reconcile with himself in the search, he goes and looks back for a, in part for that left arm. Um, 
I wonder, one of the things that struck me in the novel is that there is that body connection to memory. Uh, and I wonder if you think that different parts of our body remember things differently. <laughs> I think <coughs> I, I think it is about Iran. All Iranian people we will lose our life. And we are looking for it. Where is my left hand? It is about, after writing it, I found out that it is about Iranian people. All of us has missed. You have to translate me. How many more does the chap on our test that you mean? Uh, we have all lost our left arm. That's it. I, I was, by the way, um, I started with Cervantes, and there's a lot in this novel that I see of Cervantes, and left Cervantes also, in a, in a battle, lost his left arm, at least yeah. the mobility of the left arm. Um, the novel is very much about uh, your city, uh, or the capital city of, uh, of uh, Tehran, uh, in which you haven't lived for a long time. And this question, Shahar, is, is, it has, has a two part, or is, is made of two parts. The first one is, um, you spend all these years away from your language, or away from the people that speak the language all the time. Uh, and you, you remain steadfast and committed to writing in Persian. Um, in what way has your language changed as you have been away? Has it become more bookish, more stilted? Is it still, do you still have the same fluidity with the language that you have? What is the relationship that you have with Persian today? Uh. Such a hard question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, no, I just try to write in Persian. I say me konam ino anjam bedam. I try to do it in Persian language. Should I translate you? Sure. Would <laughs> you feel more comfortable? <laughs> Yeah, I try to write in Persian language. I emphasize uh, I struggle with it. Yeah, to write in Farsi or Persian language is what I have in this world. Otherwise, I don't have anything else in this world. So. I try to write in my language, and then it would be translated. So, what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> my question is, if all, in all these years that you have been away, the language is itself yeah, has changed yeah. for you? A little bit. <laughs> I'm looking at my country and my language from a far distance. And I found out it's a beautiful language. So it's so poetic. And so I'm trying to write in it. It's poetic language. Is I want to go no mia. It is an unknown language. Uh, yeah. So it is my pressure. What I have. <laughs> have you written anything in English? Of course I will read. <laughs> what is the name of that writer? The road? <coughs> Yeah. Hmm. 
I was in uh, I was in a uh, in an airport custom mm -hmm. and I had that book. You know, Iranians when they are in a custom, American custom, I says <laughs> you have to be so careful <laughs> because everybody thinks that you are a terrorist or <laughs> you are going to do something. So I try to be good. <laughs> and they opened my bag, and then that novel was there. And she asked me, how did you get it? I said, do you call it a novel? It is a, a so bad novel. And suddenly I found out that I made a mistake. I shouldn't, uh, <laughs> I shouldn't do that. Uh, you call that novel, it's not a good novel. <laughs> no country for old men is good, but... <laughs> um, have you, um, in connection with the city, uh, how, how often do you, have you gone, how often do you go back? Do you go back to Tehran? I think I can't. My friends called me, Sharia, don't get back to Iran. Mm -hmm. They will arrest you. And in creating a novel that deals with Iran, is this the Iran of your imagination? Yeah, I miss my country so much. Mm. I miss my city, Shiraz, although uh, the city of this novel is Tehran, but I was, I used to live in Shiraz. Mm -hmm. You know Shiraz wine. Mm. What is the process? How do you how do you work with a living author? Um, do you get portions you with somebody who knows the English language, as he does? Um, do you establish a constant dialogue? Do you do the whole thing and show it? Do you feel that you have on your left shoulder or on your right shoulder uh, <laughs> an author who's telling you this is right or this is wrong? I've worked with all kinds. Um, I much prefer the process of having a constant dialogue with the authors. Um, I think from my perspective as a translator, I prefer to work either <coughs> with an author who knows absolutely no English or one who is absolutely fluent in English. Mm -hmm. The halfway in between is the most dangerous territory <laughs> because they work with the dictionary. <laughs> and that is not always happiness, let's say. So this is one example? No, no. With <laughs> Sharia, it was different because when Sharia and I started working together, um, his English was, he, he was just starting uh, to learn English. So, um, and I think. Uh, we developed a certain level of trust between us. So uh, again, it depends on the authors, but uh, I, I much prefer them to be one extreme or the other. The halfway is, because then you know they open the dictionary and every word has so many nuances, but only one is you know presented in the dictionary. Then for every word, there's like weeks of discussion and explanation. <laughs> it, it's not. It's you know. But with Sharia, the process has always been different. Um, we always work in tandem. I never have a complete manuscript. He doesn't hand me a book and say, you know, here's the book. As he writes, I translate. Mm -hmm. So it becomes, and there are times when he calls me and he says, you know, I, I'm writing a scene that has whatever in it. Is that translatable? Or as I'm translating and he's writing, I crum come across something and I say, Sharia, th this isn't going to work. You have to rewrite it. And we discuss and he rewrites and then it, we, we make it work. So it's very much, it, if it were a completed work that was given to me and then we had to you know, work on the translation, I think it would have been a completely different experience. But that also means Sarah, that the, the translator is the first reader and the closest reader and maybe even an engaged author in, in making suggestions. This is not going to work or this is going to work. Because my question was going to be the difference between 
translating a book that has already been published in the original language in, pub in translating a manuscript is that maybe, I'm suggesting here, there is a certain freedom uh, added, a, a, a certain openness uh, with the manuscript that it is not settled in the original language and that therefore certain things can move. Absolutely. Uh, first of all, I don't listen to her. You don't <laughs> All right, so that's solved. Yeah, we're, we're, we're done. We have that's nothing right. more to say. No, but you're absolutely right because um, I can uh, give a better example with the first uh, novel that Sharia and I, well, Sharia wrote and I translated. Um, Censoring an Iranian love story has al has also never been published in the original Persian, and. If you today look at the Persian manuscript and compare it with the English manuscript, there are entire segments that are completely different. Mm. There were changes that Shariar needed to make for that story to work in the English language that was not necessary in the Persian manuscript. Mm. So segments were rewritten, there are segments deleted, segments added that are completely different. So yes, there's there is a lot more freedom when you're working with a manuscript that's raw, basically. I am. Uh, I follow up on this, Sarah, and then I'll, I'll go back to Sharia. The, I, I, I know the case of a Brazilian author um, whose translator also became very engaged in producing something for the English language. Um, and then the author, this was actually Borges, uh, when republishing the book in Spanish, took the changes that had appeared in English and inserted them into Spanish. Um, has any of, have any of the works changed as a result of the English version, but none of them have been published in Farsi? Uh, not only have they not been published in Farsi, there is no prospect of them being published in Farsi unless Sharior chooses to have them published, uh, uh, y you know, in Europe in the Farsi language, but uh, I, I don't know if he's ever made that decision. But the, basically the two manuscripts, th there, there was less of that Here. in this book, but in censoring there were, th there is a lot that was changed. And then this would be considered the final version from which other translations yes. would, would... Both censoring uh. an Iranian love story and Moonbrow, all other language translations will be based on the English. Do you want to say something? Mm. Uh, I think that after publishing this book, I can get back to my homeland. <laughs> it's, uh, they are going to make another Salman Rushdie <laughs> about me. That's it. Mm. In, in one of the reviews of your early book, uh, Censor the 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 one about the love story the censoring the a love story. Um, there is a, a, a discussion of how in the West we don't have censorship and there's a special longing for it. That if we only had censorship, we would be able to have a clear uh, uh, to we would be able to write against something. Um, you, as a writer who has been defined by censorship, um, almost reduced by censorship, what is it that you can tell the West uh, about that kind of argument? The argument of oh. um, hmm, having, having something to write against is, is sometimes valid. I don't know if you follow the question. <laughs> it is... Uh, one of the reviews that I got, it was in New Yorker. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the name of that uh, uh, writer. James Wood. James Wood, yeah. He said, when we are American writers, uh, sorry to, to say it, that we are trying to right if we could get our character outside of a room or inside of the room 
there are some books that they are censored in this world. I love it. I love this uh, writing somehow. Uh, yeah, there are some books that they deserve to be censored, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so we are writing them. I, you know, in, in the, we're going to open it to the audience for some questions. I was thinking of, of a, in Latin America, a, where I come from, for a long time, the fact that there were some dictators defined a number of Latin American writers, Garcia Marquez and Vargas Llosa and uh, Julio Cortázar, and their novels appear to have much more of, of an essence. The moment democracy came to, to, uh, to the region, uh, even their literature seemed to have lost a certain quality to it. Um, any, any comments and questions uh, from the audience? So on my way over here, I was speaking with my friend George Slava about uh, the list of books on Opus Dei's uh, uh, censorship list. So th there are books in the West that certain factions in the West would like to censor. I wonder if you could speak more specifically about the what you think um, Shariar has written in uh, censoring an Iranian love story and in Moonbrow that is in any way threatening to the regime. Uh, you can you can imagine it. Who knows? They are uh, making a sort of. Uh, Sampling. They arrest, for instance, a writer. Uh, torture. torture him, and they brought him, bring him to the TV show. Such a, a strenuous co uh, confession. So then it is a message to all of us. So I don't know if I get back to my country, if they, uh, they will arrest me or not. I don't know. I think some of the themes that uh, Shariar uh, has written about in both of the books that are kind of on unsteady ground, let's say, is the entire question of war. Um, the Iran-Iraq war was very much, um, shall we say, promoted by the Iranian government. It, it, it was known as a holy war in a way. And in both his books, Shariar has basically showed the ugly part of it, the devastation of it, the wreaking havoc of it upon a society, youth. Um, so the war itself and the mention of the war and criticism of the war, I think that itself is enough. And many, many Iranian writers among his friends, their books have been confiscated simply because it was a view of the war. Um, on the other hand, I think religion itself, its traditions, a look on the clergy and the entire culture of the clergy, the shall we say, uh, the corruption, despotism, everything that's ingrained within clergy of any religion, for that matter. I think that itself also is a big no-no. So even though I imagine that this translation is quite faithful, that what you have come with together is uh, quite um, true for you, I wonder what losses there are for you in the Englification of your work. About translation? If <laughs> the translator, uh, the translation would be beauty, beautiful, it couldn't be faithful. And if it would be faithful, it couldn't be beautiful. Uh, I said that I found a translator 
that she is beautiful and her translation is beautiful as well. Uh, I have to trust her. There are times that I can't understand. It is, is it my novel? <laughs> or her novel? <laughs> How can I? It, it happens to me when I got uh, uh, South Korean translation of my novel. I was look at it. How can I read it in this way or that way? <laughs> well, I can't. And then I thought that how how could I? چطور میتونم بدونم که این مترجم کوریی رمان خودش رو تو این رمان من جا نزده؟ How could I possibly know that the Korean translator has not printed his own novel under my name? Today we hear that Netanyahu and Trump are ratcheting up the tensions between Iran and the United States and Israel. Um, I wonder whether any of you have any words for those who make such decisions. Iran's, uh, Iran's regime, they want it. Don't do it. Don't bombing Iran because they need it to to uh, to create propaganda uh, yeah and justification so it is <laughs> let's say mr trump don't do it we will help <laughs> we, we can help our democracy and we are fighting for it don't bombing iran they need it they want it crazily by they, he means the government. Yeah. Yes? There's a pretty large population of Iranian, Iranian Americans. Um, by and large, are they, are they unsympathetic to the regime, critical of the regime, or are they by and large sympathetic? Uh, most of them are against the regime, I think particularly in uh, East, uh, West Coast, in Los Angeles. Uh, they call it Tehrangeles. <laughs> and most of them are against the regime, yeah. But I don't know how some of them can go to Iran and get back safely without any problem. So it is, uh, but I'm not going to think about it, that people, uh, they bother, I am suffering from it. Uh, that some Iranians, uh, you can't, you can't translate it. I that in the <laughs> out of the trough and the feet back too. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what you did? <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> yes, uh, some of them, they are not good. Um, I, have a, I have a question for both of you. Um, when there were uh, different uh, exile communities, the Russians, the Yiddish, uh, the French, when living in the United States is in connection with the question that you asked, have a created an, an, a, a cultural infrastructure uh, and uh, it included for a number of different uh, groups uh, a publishing side to it. Uh, Nabokov published a number of his books in Russia and outside of Russia. So is there a population of Iranian Americans where Farsi, the, the Persian language remains and there's a, there's a thriving literature scene? No? And why is and why is that so? I don't know. I honestly don't have an answer for you uh, because there is, as the gentleman mentioned, a very large right. uh, population of Iranian Americans in this country, and for the most part, a great majority are very well educated, uh, very successful professionally. And uh, they keep the two languages. Absolutely, most of them. 
it, even my niece who's here, she was born here and she speaks fluent Farsi and she writes Farsi. Mm -hmm. So it's very much within our culture that even the second generation, third generation are, are taught mm -hmm. um, our language. However, I do not understand why there are th there are no publishers out there who would publish Persian literature. In Europe, there are. Mm -hmm. there, uh, there are one or two in France. There's uh, one in Germany, I think. Um, so uh, they do exist in Europe, but not in the US, and maybe you know why. I don't know. Uh, and we are not going to publish it since I can get back to my country. <laughs> this is what I swear in God, uh, particularly censoring an Iranian love story. I will publish it in Persian language since I can get back to my country and publish there, hmm. publish it in Farsi. Yes. I just it's more uh, comments uh, to what you were just talking about. Listening to you read it in Farsi, as good as the translation, of course, is is very beautiful and very poetic. And I'm, uh, it's too bad that the audience can't hear that. And I hope that there would be a day that you can somehow have it available to those of us who um, can Thank understand you. Farsi. Thank so it's, it's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. How different do you think the translation would have been if you were just given the manuscript and weren't able to talk to the author? Uh, I, I think translating it would have been a lot more challenging than it was because uh, in, in this particular case, in other cases with other books and authors, it may be different. Shariar's prose are very complicated. Oftentimes it's poetry and prose. He um, weaves language uh, in a very intricate way. He ravels narrative and then unravels it and re-ravels it in different ways. And there were many instances that if I didn't have access to him, if he wasn't a phone call away, um, I'm not sure I would have gotten it right because his uh, prose are so complicated in certain instances. He plays with language in a very clever way. And again, I, I don't think I would have taken on the challenge of translating this book if I didn't have him. So let me ask you the question that I asked him before. Do you think that the, his language between the first book you translated and the second book is different? No. It's the same? Not at all. I would say, as complicated as it was with the first book, with the second book, I think he gave himself a freer hand with his prose because he knew somehow we'd make it work. With the first book, it was the first time we were working mm. together. He didn't know. He didn't know whether I was going to ruin his book. Good. <laughs> I had an American friend, I have. She told me, Sharia, there, there is uh, one of your stories is published in Pen American um, anthology. And the translator is so good. Find her. So I was at the Brown University for a fellowship. Then I tried to find her. And we start to talk to each other. Soro, my Shariar, I'm, 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 I'm Shariar, Soro. <laughs> Shariar Mundanipur. Uh, can we talk, uh, can we do our job? again do something in translation and she said okay she was so kind and met one boot and then you can't believe it uh, i was at brown university with a good fellowship for nine months 
So Sharia, you are outside of Iran. Then what? What are you going to write? It was uh, a festival at Brown University. Do, uh, do you think that I need a translator or not? <laughs> no, I think you can manage. Uh, it was a festival at Brown University that Salman Rushdie and Orhan Pamuk were invited. And Orhan Pamuk got the Nobel Prize at that time. So I was shy of what about you. <laughs> it is Salman Rushdie. If you shake hand with him, you can get back to your country. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I salute for, for him. <laughs> at the dinner. <laughs> and Oran Pamuk, uh, he got the Nobel Prize. I can't, I, uh, I don't like his, his writing anyway. <laughs> so I said, what I am going to read at that festival? Then I came, it came to my mind, writing a story about censorship and about it. The story, the subject of the story could be about censorship. So I started to write a short story about it. Then I found out that I can write it more and more. And I started to write. Because I am a smoker, I couldn't smoke in my because uh, I was living with my son. We had a good apartment at uh, that city, Brown University, Providence. But I couldn't smoke. So I smoked in, uh, in my um, bed. Uh, <laughs> bedroom. I don't to see any Quran. I don't. Uh, I don't recommend it. <laughs> don't write a story in your bedroom. <laughs> um, just to conclude it, I want to uh, mention that for um, small publishers, the role that translators play is crucial. Um, not only because they bring the work from other languages, but because they are also scouts that help us identify what is in different countries and how uh, that particular uh, narrative could make it here. And of course, the, the success of any good translated book depends on the marriage of the author and the translator. It's not any translator that can translate a text. It's a translator that has to get the chemistry and the author that has to get the chemistry of the translator. I want to take this opportunity before we go to say that there are other types of scouts and people who bring to us works that matter. And in this particular case, it was thanks to Askold, uh, who first pointed my attention to the work that uh, Shahriar has been, had been doing, that we have this book uh, in front and it, without his original invitation would not have taken place. Uh, I want to thank both of you very much for this conversation and uh, congratulations for the publication. Thank you all.